God, we are so grateful for who you are, who you've revealed yourself to be, and in particular, what we can know about you through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the work that he did here on earth as one of us. Would you move here tonight? Would your spirit illuminate your truth in all of our hearts and in the presence of your body? Would we grow closer to one another and to you? Amen. Amen. All right. I have here a very clear explanation of all of the theological implications of the Gospels. Now... If you can see this board at all, and many of you can't, I am aware, and I am sorry. Uh, it's not all that clear, nor is it all that summative. So, um, but, but we'll get started anyhow. We're talking about redemption today. Uh, we've gone from creation to fall to covenant. And... Now we're moving on to redemption. Well, why do we need redemption? Because the covenant didn't work out so well for us, right? I mean, so that's what we we covered the last two weeks, is that humanity was created, and then very shortly after this creation, uh, humanity didn't work out. We fell. Our reason was broken, our relationship with God was broken, and so we hit the reset, right? We got cast out, and then God said, well, enough is enough, and sent the flood, and started over, and then shortly after that, we had Babel, and that was kind of a reset moment as well, so he broke them up and said, gosh, I'm going to put all these guys in time out, and uh, so he gave us different languages, and then Abraham came. And from Abraham, this relationship between God and man was established, and, uh, and that was the covenant. And so we walked through two weeks ago just what happened with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. So in Genesis chapter 15, you have uh, God make a covenant with Abraham. He gets He gets Abraham to do all the grunt work and split the animals in half. That's an important part of ancient covenantal customs. And so all the blood's draining in the middle. Um, Things are going as per usual. But then Abraham takes a nap, which is not super usual in covenantal customs. Um, But in the midst of this nap, God shows up in a vision and moves through the blood himself, thus signifying that he is going to take on the punishment for the failure of the other. So usually what happens in the covenant is you both enter into the blood and you say like, well, if I don't do what I'm telling you I'm going to do, then you can cut me in half and stomp on my blood. But if you don't do what you say you're going to do for me, then I'll cut you in half and stomp in your blood. And everybody's like, great. It's like spitting in your hand and shaking or something like that, but way more gruesome and smells so bad. I don't know from personal experience. I'm not, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> Anyhow, here we are on the other side of the covenant things not working out so well. We didn't hold up to our end of the bargain, and so God comes down and suffers the consequence that we all deserved. And that in some way brings about atonement. Atonement. This, there is some redemptive, some substitutionary event that takes place And so what Jesus does applies now to us and also to Israel. That's my introduction. We're going to get more into atonement, uh, anthropology, homardiology, soteriology, cosmology, and all the freaking ologies. Uh, We're going to get there later. But right now, I want to talk about specifically how did... You know, we've, th- this whole class has been an exercise in understanding how did, if God is telling us that we can know him through who he is, that he's revealing himself through his actions, 
and that his actions are recorded in his word, we're at a really important part of the story when we find out that Jesus is the word of God that was with God, right? That's the beginning of John. All right, we're at the climax here. So we need to pay real close attention to how is God communicating himself at this point in the story when Jesus Christ is both God and man and has come down in earth, on earth to dwell among us. Huge transition point in the story. So how is this being communicated? Well, I wanted to make it real simple and clear, but unfortunately, uh, even N.T. Wright wrote several books on it, and I'm not N.T. Wright, and so I can't make it clear or simple, but perhaps some of these terms will help narrow it down so that you, as you read, you'll be able to get more out of it and see how things are being communicated. My understanding of Mark, um, and I am borrowing a lot from, uh, from N.T. Wright on a lot of these categories, is that Mark, uh, likely the account given to John Mark, who shows up in Acts, um, is the account of Peter. Um, Peter and John Mark had a close relationship, um, and so we think that this is, this is the first-ish. There are theories of an earlier uh, account of Jesus' life, but this is at least the oldest surviving of, of the gospel writings. And so what, is, what Peter, through Mark, or Mark himself by influence of Peter, is trying to communicate is an apocalyptic lens, an apocalyptic change um, in the fabric of the cosmos, in the ordering of the world. And so you have things like Mark 13, where, where all of the imagery gets really eerie and end of days-ish, um, but really, all of Mark, all of the Gospel of Mark, is written to show that when Jesus came down, God was changing the fabric of his relationship with man. And uh, I know I said apocalypse, so you're all scared and nervous and you need me to explain myself. Well, fine. Apocalypse doesn't mean um, that there is like fire descending and we all, uh, you know, get raptured up or something like that. But apocalypse, uh, I mean, it just means from being hidden. It's an unveiling. It's a, it's a vision, revelation, right? Apocalypse, is, that's, that's what it means, is something was hidden and now it's being shown forth. And the way that that genre is written is with really powerful images, and yet, that doesn't necessarily mean that these powerful images are, are going to be amplified and, and that all of the crazy things have, uh, you know, denotative uh, parallels with what actually corresponds, but that something really magnificent is happening. And the only way to express it is through using strong language and um, images that show the power of the events. So not ne it's not necessarily, I don't want to write it off as just metaphor, right? It's, it's, it's a form of metaphor used very often in Jewish literature to show that God's intervention in the world is beyond human comprehension. And I don't think that any of us in this room would disagree with that. It's a way of engaging with a transcendent truth that just cannot be expressed simply. Okay? And so that is at the heart of Mark's gospel. Matthew, I started, I started with the hardest one to explain. So it gets easier. Matthew is writing what we think pretty much right after the temple gets destroyed in 70 AD, right? So Christianity has been alive for a little while now, but 
there's this new opportunity to witness to a Jewish audience. The ones who initially rejected Jesus as the Messiah, well, the temple has been destroyed. And so their whole faith is shaken now. And Matthew thinks, well, if you guys will hearken back to a few years ago, my buddy Jesus said a lot of things about explaining why this would happen and where we might turn now. And so there is this lens of, well, in, in Matthew, you hear all the time about the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. And so Matthew is recalling these teachings of Jesus showing like, hey, you guys are so concerned with temple worship. And that didn't pan out. But remember that Jesus was talking about a kingdom that operated under a different set of rules. And so we don't need to be dependent on this temple anymore. We have what Jesus has brought us. One of the, oh, I guess I'll save that for, for later, but um, there's all of, these, all of these gospels are going to be using images very consistent with their tradition, very consistent with the history of, the salvation history revealed through the Torah that show how Jesus is fulfilling everything. So Matthew starts his book off with the actual words, like the Geneseos. It's, I mean, he's talking about Genesis. He's talking about the, it's the um, in the generation of. Um, and by giving the history of Jesus marching through, the guys that we've talked about this whole class, right? Through Abraham and then David and then into exile and the history of the Jewish people where, where Jesus is born at the climax of this history and how he is fulfilling the covenantal destiny of the Jewish people. Jesus is Israel, okay? I, I read last time, and I know it was frantic and hurried, but um, as is everything that I do, but <laughs> Isaiah 49, um, 1 through 7, this is, this is the second um, servant song in Isaiah. Um, there are four. But we, we're introduced to this character, the servant, and this, this suffering servant, and everybody's like, yes, yes. It's talking about Jesus. Well, yes, but it's talking about Israel. And it's talking about you and me, right? It's, that's the thing about uh, Scripture that's alive and breathing, that has the Holy Spirit testifying and witnessing to us, is that it talks about a lot of things at once. We don't just get to limit it. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. He acts on behalf of Israel. Um, he acts on behalf of Moses during the Sermon on the Mount where he goes up and he is teaching on the law from the mountain. You know, Moses went up, he got the Ten Commandments, he comes down and teaches. Well, Jesus is both God giving the law and Moses orating it to the people. He's fulfilling all of this and um, expounding on Moses' law saying, you guys took this law and did bad things with it and I am here to correct you. Luke on the other hand, starts with a different method and probably the most literarily intriguing method. You remember, uh, those of you who were here last class, I made a big deal about how the book of 1 Samuel starts. The, how does the kingdom of Israel begin? Well, it begins with a barren couple, prayer, a miraculous son born out of a barren womb from nothing. I've made a big deal about God doing things from nothing this whole time, so I'm not going to stop now. So a prophet, Samuel, is born in a time of silence and is dedicated to the service of the Lord. And Samuel, the one, the, his name means hearing God or God hears, um, well, both, not either or, but certainly both and, he comes in a time when God has been silent and hears God and speaks God's words to the people, 
after the time of the judges. At the, well, he is the last judge. Luke starts his gospel when, with John the Baptist, who is born of a barren couple. And then when he's born, his father cries out in a song the way that Hannah, Samuel's mother, did. And Samuel goes about his ministry and anoints David king. What does John do? He anoints the king. He starts the kingdom on earth. So whereas Matthew is real insistent about the kingdom, Luke expounds that even further by showing, yes, look how God has acted again. God, he wasn't even being subtle. You guys, God was so straightforward about this. It's just the same. We were promised a Davidic king, and he has reiterated the circumstances of Samuel and David almost to the T for us. It should be easy for us to see what God is doing. That's that's how Luke is structuring his story about who Jesus is. Now John. Oh, my boy John. John, he's the weirdest. If Luke's the most literarily, you know, intriguing uh, and intricate, John's the poet. We, we just, we have to get down with John and we have to let John do John's thing. Um, now, a lot of folks, they want to over-theologize what, what John's doing. They say, oh, well, everybody else is kind of writing history, but John's writing a a theology of Jesus. Well, I just don't think that that does justice to John's commitment to truth. Truth is the major theme of John's book. If, you know, and he starts it with the logos, right? The word. And it's true that we, you know, John shows a very divine Jesus throughout his gospel, but he also shows the most human Jesus that you've ever seen. Because what John's project is, is all of these, re- the synoptics, really talk a lot about Jesus' work. What did Jesus do? And how are we to respond? But John, I mean, he laid on Jesus rest. He watched his best friend die and then rise back to life. John is more concerned with who Jesus is than what he's done. Um, and that's, you know, that's not to, in a, you know, as they say today, throw shade at <laughs> any, of, uh, any of these cats. But John is trying to fill in a gap where he thinks that these other accounts have you know, had their, their own genre. He's saying, well, there's something else that you guys need to see about Jesus. And he wants the incarnation that Jesus came down to be in the flesh and the tension of the divinity and humanity to be resting in one being at once. He breathed that in. He could feel it. He was there. And so all throughout John's gospel, it's the, that Jesus was actually here and that there was a truth in him. And Logos, uh, s- some folks, I, I don't know how much you guys have heard, uh, but some folks will say, oh, John is the evangelist. He's witnessing to the Greeks because he's talking about Logos and the Greeks love logic. And so there's that. Well, it's true, but a lot of people spoke Greek. And so there, there was wisdom literature, Jewish wisdom literature, that also dealt with, um, with wisdom and as a reference to God and his ordering of creation. So this abiding light, I think, for John is that the very being which created all of the world came down to be a human and live with him. And that transformed everything that John thought about everything that John saw. It was the difference between light and darkness for him. It 
permeated through all of his thinking just to see the way that the, the truth and the light that came through Christ. And, and I went over it on the first day, but th- this comes to a head in chapters 18 and 19, where Pilate asks, what is truth? And Jesus, but Jesus is right there in front of him. You know, it's the great irony is you're, you're asking me what truth is as if it were some objective because, you know, he's a, he's a Roman statesman. Everything needs to be ordered. He needs to be able to diagnose things and, and put a label on it. But the truth was that the innocent and all-powerful God came down to be killed by those who had no power or no right. The truth is a conundrum. It's nonsensical. It's a disruption of any natural order that we could have thought of. That's what's being put on the spotlight in John's gospel, is that there is the only righteousness and the only reason comes from outside of this world to break it apart from within. So that is at the heart of John's gospel. And these, you know, are the narrative through which redemption is told. Obviously, it is interpreted through Paul and Peter and and the other cats, and we're going to get over to that side of the board in a little while. But, I don't know, I I thought that 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 would be helpful to you guys as you're reading the Gospels to see, well, how are these disciples of Christ interpreting his actions? Well, they do have a framework. It's not just a random listing of things that Jesus did, but they have a framework that's guiding how they intuited all of Christ's actions for them. So, what are some of the themes then? Well, the wilderness, right? 40 days in the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness, right? This is not, I mean, this isn't a mistake. Christ did things on purpose, and the disciples were able to pick up on them sometimes, uh, though sometimes he had to tell them because they weren't able to pick up on them, which, you know, like me, like me. Um, One of my favorite moments in in all of scripture is here is when Jesus is being tempted and maybe that says something about my character but Satan you know creeps up I imagine he creeps up because I imagine him as creepy but he creeps up and he says you look hungry man you could turn this you know you could you could turn these these stones into bread and uh and you could, you could make these people rejoice. And, and he starts quoting scripture, Jesus. And Jesus says, well, he responds with scripture. He says, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And in that response is, you know, you, you can hear Jesus saying, Please, I am the word of God. You don't get to use that against me. I know what I'm saying. You don't, I'm not going to hear anything that you say. But we do hear because we, we do want the things that Satan's offering. But in Jesus' temptations, he is the word and will not be duped by his word, but is correcting the misinterpretation of the word all throughout. Again, with the law, you have heard... Do not murder. But what I say to you is anyone who is even angry with his brother has committed murder in his own heart. This is Jesus taking the law and with authority interpreting it. You know, we could be mad at the Pharisees all we want and say that they they were leading all the people astray. They were concerned about the word of God and were trying to organize themselves around it. They were just 
doing it wrong, more wrongly to use an adverb in the right place. But the pr lest we be too critical, we have to remember that we've also developed a lot of doctrines and we maybe need to take a look at the Pharisees and say, we could be wrong about some things. As we read the Gospels, the Pharisees are, are a mirror image. You know, they, they, were, they were righteous men with, with good intentions. They wanted to bring about the next era. They wanted to see the Messiah come. But they were so concerned about trying to force the Messiah to come that they didn't recognize that the Messiah had come. Because they wanted it done on their terms. They weren't asking God, they were telling God. We get into that business too. I mean, that's what, that's what happened at Babel. It's what happened with the Pharisees. And we get into it ourselves, trying to get God to... <clears throat> bring, uh, good things bring healing in our lives. I had a, a very close friend of mine is paralyzed from the chest down. Horrible dirt biking accident. And I don't know how many days I went without food, fasting and praying... God heal him, and it didn't work. It didn't happen. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm doing my part. What about you? And he said, well, no, you actually don't have any faith. You're just trying to control me. I love your friend, too. I love him more than you do. You don't know what's best for him. Why don't you just concern yourself with loving your friend and praying for his needs and, ask, you know, and, and submitting to my will? And then you might see some good fruit change. And of course, my friend gets married and he's happy. And it's whatever. I mean, <laughs> Paul gets to boast in God and God gets to boast in God. And I suppose that we should boast in God too and let him do his thing. Anyhow, suffering servant. Again, suffering servant comes back from Isaiah. Jesus is the suffering servant. Um, but he's also the Davidic king. He also happens to come from nothing and really embrace a theology of from nothingness, right? Who does he hang out with? That's right. The statesmen and the rich. No, the people that have nothing, that don't even care about God, that didn't have any faith to speak of, they were the people that could hear with fresh ears because they didn't have their own presuppositions or their own demands. But from nothing and having nothing, they were hungry to get something and were able to perceive that something was being offered them. And that it's to the nations. Remember, I mean, in uh, Genesis 12, from the very onset of Abraham's calling, it was always supposed to be for others, right? That's why all of our churches are so good about getting out into the community and hanging out with other people that aren't like us. Is because we've all heard this word and adhere to it faithfully. So then, where I'd like to spend... Okay, good. We're, we're halfway through. Where I'd like to spend the rest of the time is we've looked at some of the themes and there is, uh, you know, I, I've debated on whether or not I should just walk through the story of Jesus' life with you guys. Um, but I do think that what we need to talk to, talk, speak to, talk about is how is Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension redemptive? How does it achieve anything? Why, I mean, God, couldn't he have just snapped his fingers and said, I forgive, let's move on, I can make you obey me? What is it about the way that things happened? If he says he's... He is revealing himself to us by what he does. What is it about how he's revealed himself that gives us a lens for understanding how this whole thing works? 
So I have a quote written down here that almost none of you can see, which says, that which Jesus did not assume, he did not redeem. That's by Gregory of Nazianzus. And so, and that logic harkens back to the covenant, right? We, Jesus had to come and die because that's how God said he was going to do it from Genesis chapter 15 forward. So in that sense, we, we knew that it was going to take that kind of drastic imagery. But why even further than that? Well, it seems that the makeup of the cosmos and therefore how anthropology, how we are made, something needed to be transformed in us. There is something about the way that God made us that allows us to live according to patterns. And so when sin enters into the story, there is a corruption of sorts, and there's all sorts of biblical imagery for what sin does. Um, does sin put us in debt? That's what Anselm, Saint Anselm, uh, would say, is that sin made us infinite debtors to God, and this debt needed to be paid. Right, but this whole image of debt and payment this is a metaphor, a useful metaphor, but it's not, it's not the, the totality of it. I mean, we, I think a lot of us think in terms of uh, there's an atonement theory or motif, uh, as my professor would say, um, on penal substitutionary atonement, that we deserve punishment, we are unjust, which is similar to debt, uh, just not so materially oriented. We're unjust, and we need to be punished. And so instead of us being punished, Jesus takes the punishment. And that levels the playing field. Um, but that's really not the totality of it. I'm not saying I disagree with that. That is a part of it. But there's no way that we get to rise up in a new life. Uh, and, and I think that, that if, we, if we just stick with that, that paints a very angry picture of God. But I want today to present you with a, a fuller picture wherein you understand that God's mercy and His wrath are the same. There's a, a doctrine called divine simplicity. There is no dis distinction between God's love and God's wrath. They're not separate. They're, he doesn't get to do one thing that contradicts another, but they're actually all the same. And so it's not just that the cosmos was structured in such a way that when we did something wrong, God had to go in and write it himself in order to fix our wrong. Because that puts God under the authority of some sort of cosmic rule. But who God is and how he did make the cosmos is such that he wants us to live in him. Now, he is... a when sin came about and this covenant was broken, that was all part of the plan for us to be able to witness his triumph, his victory. So the substitutionary atonement is complemented by his victory. Let me read you um, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. This, I think this, uh, this passage 
really adequately shows both aspects of both the substitution and the victory. And you who were dead in your trespasses, so here we, here we have the penalty of sin, which is death. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. Uh, this image needs to be unpacked a little bit. So the record of debt uh, in the ancient world would oftentimes, they would, it, it would be like getting a ticket or something, except instead of leaving it on your windshield, they would n- nail it on your door. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying, yeah, instead of your debt being nailed to your door before they arrest you or whatever and make an example of you, Jesus took all those debts and he nailed it to the cross when he, his hands and feet were being nailed to the wood there. You, you want to find your debts, you can go look to the cross and see they're covered in Christ's blood. That's the substitution. And he goes on, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. This is what would, what would happen with uh, enemy rulers or authorities when, uh, Roman, uh, when the Romans would conquer them is they would parade them around town. They would be locked up in a cage behind the chariot, and they would just get shown around town as, look at these defeated figures. And here, this is what Christ is doing in his actions. There is triumph. It's not just about God fixing a little brokenness, but it's about God winning and God being glorious. In, uh, in seminary, we had to read, I, I took a class on the person and work of Christ, and disappointingly, we did not read an, even a single verse from the Gospels, but we read just a ton about atonement. And one guy that we read is called Maximus the Confessor. And what was happening with the church back then was people were concerned about the nature of Christ's victory. You see, uh, because the victory was... uh, was that he is deceiving the devil. And so there are these, that what are the implications of this deceit, right? That uh, the devil thought that he was winning because of the agreement based on, you know, what's, the sinners are mine and he's taking on the sin for them and so I'll have him, right? And, but God doesn't let him know what's happening. And so through the cross, God tricks the devil and wins all. And so some people are like, well, but that makes God a trickster and a liar. That's, you know, that's, that's wrong. Well, maybe. If God wants to trick somebody, he could trick somebody, I guess. But I don't think that as I hear about that victory, I recall, I recall, Aslan going to the stone table, right? Aslan comes and he, he agrees to be the substitute and he pays the price. He lets them shave, you know, his body and humiliate him and then put him to death. And there on the stone table, the lion lays where the liar should have been, right? 
and yet the stone table breaks. Yeah, I mean, we know the story. The stone table breaks, and there was a deeper magic. I don't think that that's deceit in the victory. I think that that, I mean, all of that was accessible. I, I'm, presumably the devil has Google. He, he could have known. But it's, I think that the victory shows the short-sightedness and the fickleness of earthly powers. Again, this is, this is hearkening back to John. I think that this is one of the elements is you just, we're never going to be able to nail down precisely what it looks like because all of it is divine mystery. It's all going to be beyond us, but we get little glimpses of it through each of these perspectives. And that's part of what John does, I think, really well, is, is, is this showing how things, things in the world are breaking apart from the inside. And so, through Christ, we see Israel redeemed, right? We see him go through the wilderness, and instead of complaining about not having enough bread, not, and, you know, like, you took us from a place where we had plenty of food and water. I mean, we remember the Israelites grumbling in the wilderness. Well, Jesus goes to the wilderness, and he could have had as much as he wanted, and he turns it down. He, does, he not only keeps the law, all of the little tedious details of the law, but what about you shall love the law? The wise man meditates on the law day and night. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, the Lord says to Joshua. He loves the law. He is the law. As a man, I mean, you know, C.S. Lewis said, I kind of thought of it as cheating because he's, he's a man, sure, but he's, he's also God. So it's like, you know, what, what is that, how does that really, how, how does that even work out? It's not fair. It's, you know, it's like he had help. Well, he, well yeah, maybe. And then he, he, he reflects later, he says, at the same time, if I'm trying to get out of a river that I'm drowning in, if somebody offers me help that's standing on the shore, I'm not going to call him a cheater, <laughs> you know? But it is, it is significant that he is human in his life for our redemption. He really does have to be a Jewish man according to this covenant. He, he set that standard for himself. And a lot of our theologies, we, we kind of pretend as if Jesus were just this spiritual figure and, and you know, he was able to bear all of these things in life because he had all of this divine help. But he really did experience things as a, a limited person like you and me. He, he was just able to have real faith. Now, you know, what that means about his relationship with the Spirit, again, we're getting into Trinitarian things, and my brain blows up. I can't explain all that for you. But we know for certain that he wants us to take it seriously, that he was a man and lived as a man, and in a, a very real way. And so he's baptized in the Jordan, crosses over into conquest like Joshua. He suffers as a servant. And to what effect? If you guys have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, 
who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let me pause there. I had to memorize all of Romans 8 when I was uh, like 17 years old at a Christian camp. It was was part of our summer program. Uh, And it's maybe one of the best things that I've ever been forced to do. But when I, when I first memorized it, and I, I mean, it spoke a lot of truth into me, there were things that I, just, that I just missed, that I just went over. Because I thought that the law of the spirit of life and this law of sin and death were... Well, I, I, I thought maybe that the law of sin and death was, was Moses, right? All of these things that condemn me, you know, that's no, that's no and not, not that I, we didn't care about Moses anymore, but that there was something deficient. But the truth that Jesus comes to fulfill is that while... The law of Moses did make us aware of our sins. The law of the spirit of life was not different from that law, but was the strength, was new strength coming through, entering into mankind to live into this law in a transformative way. It's not that there was a problem with the law, right? It's that somehow sin corrupted us so that all of our attempts to do anything right were governed by ourselves. We are inherently selfish beings. But what Christ comes down to do, and not just symbolically, but by his very actions transforms the potential of humanity. I'm sorry, I don't mean to use abstract terms, but he breaks the cosmic wheel, right? There was a, there was a logic that was true in the world, and then God became material and broke it. The table is broken, and there is a new potential for us to actually by the same Spirit of Christ, by the Holy Spirit, to live into the law in such a way that we're no longer just doing things for us, but are participating in divine worship. As we, as the church, and this is, you know, getting into what we're going to talk about next week, what does it mean to be the church? We are Christ. We are Jesus in this world. And I am going to throw Bonhoeffer at you next week. I will do it. But we need to act. And now, for the first time, after Christ has given his life, not just that he dies, it's not just about his death. He has to raise up from the grave. If he does not get up from the dead, then we are in trouble, right? That's where some of our brothers and sisters have gone astray, is they want to just make this a myth. If Jesus does not get up from the dead, then there is, there is no life coming. There is nothing different in us. I don't, it's not, a a story can be inspiring and I'll love it. You heard me talk about Lord of the Rings. But if Jesus doesn't get up from the dead, the world is not transformed. There is not a new spirit of the law of life and we cannot live for any other good but our own ends. But by the grace of God, we can now live for something that is bigger than us. 
we can become the bride of Christ and we can hunger and thirst for souls around the world to be restored by the redeeming love of Jesus and to become one of us. Our salvation is, was never about just getting right with Jesus. It was about getting creation right with Jesus because if you look down a little bit further, you will see that, uh, which verse is it? The creation groans as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present moment. All of creation, all of humanity, we, it's not about getting yourself saved, folks. That's not what atonement is. Atonement is bringing humanity to the fulfillment of its God-ordained purpose. And that is for us to live as one. And by the blood of Christ, all of those debts and all of those isolations that make us turn in on ourselves, those are stripped away so that we can actually be open and vulnerable. And the Spirit is drawing us into communion. I mean, this is what we do at communion, is we take Jesus' body and we all go up to that rail together. And this is the first church, actually, that I've been to where we, we get to come up together and, and be at the rail. There's, that's a, a really beautiful thing. And I'm not saying that churches that don't get to do that are, are you know, doing it deficiently. But there's, there's something really impactful about being able to get up there and see everybody that you're in communion with, right? That's the point, is that we're all being brought into this one body that was here. It was really here in the incarnation, and we are really taking it in a real way when we take communion. Now, I'm not saying that it turns into biological flesh and biological blood. I don't know what happens there. It's a divine mystery. It's what I love about my job. When I don't know, I just say, no, it's beyond me. It's written into the system. <laughs> But when we take communion, we are being sustained into his flesh to be his flesh and go out. It's called mass for a reason. It's, it's the missile. We're supposed to go out into the world and be Jesus because we've just gotten him. And this is the redemption. Redemption does not happen in stagnation. Redemption is action. Redemption is the new trajectory of God's image. Um, we've got five minutes. I was really tempted to talk to you guys about uh, my friend uh, Rene Girard. Um, I could do it in five minutes. It's a simple book. You guys aren't hungry, are you? So, Girard has a really powerful understanding of sin, um, and he calls it the scandal. You see, he thinks that all of the Bible is really about the Tenth Commandment, um, which is do not covet. You see, because when we got at the first instance of eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, I refuse to call it an apple. <laughs> at the first instance of this, people are driven apart. You know, we start making distinctions, pointing fingers. No longer are they able to walk as, as partners, but they recognize their, their separateness. I mean, they try to clothe themselves as if there was someone else looking, right? So the whole of human history, he see, says, is this cycle that always, always, always leads to violence. Why does it lead to violence? Well, because we want to become God. And everybody else, we, we get into competition with each other because if they have something that we don't have, well, then they're closer to being God than we are. And by golly, I won't have it because I've got to be God. And so, and all of this is happening kind of on the subconscious level. Some people are more aware of it and some are not. But anyhow, basically, what happens when you get into society is that you have a bunch of these little gods that get together. And it doesn't matter how polite we are in the South, we just get this frustration that builds up and builds up and builds up until it requires what? A victim. Somebody has to suffer because of our frustrations. I mean, how many th stress therapy balls are there? I mean, we, we need to do something about our inconveniences, right? 
We, we can all recognize that. What Girard says is that human history is written by the mass explosions of these events, is that we just pick somebody to execute. Now, maybe it was the Jews in World War II. We've seen what's happened in our own town. Um, the exhibits that are being built just now, right? We, have, we, we recognize this in our history, but also, where else? Well, of course, in Jesus' time, right? Everybody was so stressed out and fed up, that, and these Jews, and they wanted their Messiah, and they couldn't have him, and he kept poking the bear, and so they picked a victim, because it's what people do. And Gerard says the, the tricky part is that the devil gets in, and he, he just... He helps get it started. He stirs the pot, and he, he points out one person or one group and so that he can unify everybody against them, unbeknownst to themselves, right? Because now they're collaborating together, and it brings in all this unity and this feeling of like, oh, we're accomplishing something. We're working together. <coughs> Babel. Now, in the chaos, they pick a victim, and they destroy it, right? Well... Let's take a look at what Jesus does. Uh, you remember when some Pharisees bring up a, a woman who's caught in the act of adultery? Jesus, he doesn't look them in the eye. He doesn't allow them to make her the victim or make himself the victim, but he asks probing questions so that they realize that they're all guilty too. There is nobody that gets to be the guilty solution to their pain. We've all contributed. We all contribute to the scandal. But what Jesus does when he is crucified, everybody turns their eyes to gaze at the one who's crucified above all. And so it's a, it's a public execution, but he doesn't stay dead. This is how he transforms everything, is because when he rises again, Satan is exposed. It's revealed what Satan has done. He just gets people together and, and gets them to destroy one thing at a time. And yet, because Christ couldn't stay dead and Satan didn't have the power of death over him, we all look and we say, God have mercy. I killed him. And we did. We did, all of us. We killed him, not just the people that nailed him. But we can look and see, I did that to him, and I continue to do it. But he is alive. And I only know it, I only know that I killed him because he's alive and he came back and he's speaking to me, and I can tra I'm now transformed by his power of life. I can, I can ask that into myself to put an end to the cycle. And that's Gerard, and I went zero minutes over. Um, all right. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the time and the space to reflect on your work and your identity and the way that you love us. Lord, help us to never forget. Put it on our minds day and night, what you've done for us, who we are to you. Lord, would you help us to eat this meal fully loving the body of Christ that you've put us in, sustaining us into joy and gladness in the worship of your name, that we would be able to move forward and leave these walls and this place of comfort to get out and do your will. To participate in our redemption by working for the redemption of the world that you've called us into. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.